Hey guys, so glad you decided to tune in to Virtual Life Groups today. I've got a few announcements and then we're going to turn it over to Aaron for another week of Losers Club. But first, I want to give you sort of an update of where we're headed for the summer. So in the next three weeks, we are going to start meeting in person and we're calling these midweek gatherings or midweek hangouts. So here's the plan. So this coming Wednesday, which is July 17th and then July 24th, and then, I'm sorry, June 17th, June 24th, and then July 1st, we're going to meet at 12 o'clock lunchtime to 2 o'clock at the pavilion at the JF Fields for a midweek gathering. The first week, next week, which is June the 17th, you're just going to bring your own food. We're going to have games, we're going to have music, and we're going to bring the dessert, and we're just going to have an amazing time hanging out with each other. The 24th, we're doing... Malibu Midweek, which is a Hawaiian themed. It'll be a lot of fun. Dress in your best Hawaiian outfits. We've got a huge, amazing surprise for you. Uh, so you're going to want to be over there for that. And then July 1st, we're doing, we're calling it America Midweek. And it's going to be a huge grill out party for July 4th week. It'll be a lot of fun, but we want to see you there. So Midweek Gathering starting next week, June the 17th, from 12 o'clock to 2 o'clock, lunchtime to 2 o'clock at the fields, the pavilion, uh, the JF fields. So show up there, let your parents know, invite all your friends, and we'd love to hang out with you. Also, we're still doing 20 in 2020. We'd want you to join us, and you can find that link on our Instagram bio. So at JF Middle School, head to our Instagram. You don't have to have Instagram to find it. Just type in Google at JF Middle School Instagram. It'll show up, click the top link in our bio, and you can start reading the Bible with us in 20 and 2020. Okay, that's all the announcements that I have. Let's turn it over to Aaron on week three of the Losers Club. Hello everyone, welcome to Virtual Life Groups. So glad that you and your life group have decided to join us this Sunday. We're continuing in the third week of our Losers Club series. And today we're going to look at the life of a woman who had a really bad reputation. She had made some bad decisions in her life, probably. We don't know a lot of her backstory, but the job that she had is an indication um, that, that maybe she'd fallen on hard times. Maybe she'd made some bad decisions. Um, maybe she just grew up kind of like an outcast in society. But the result is that she is an outcast. She is poor, she's living on the wall of a city, a city called Jericho, and she has a job that none of us would really want to have. And we see in today's story that God still uses her in some pretty incredible ways, that even though she has this poor reputation, God still sees her, looks down on her, and uses her in big ways in his story of redemption. So something we'll see today is that no one is outside of God's reach and every person's story can be used for God's glory, even those that we might consider to be losers. So honestly, the Bible is full of stories like the one that we're going to look at today. Somebody who you would least expect, maybe somebody who's really far from God, somebody who's living in a life of sin, who's living in a life of rebellion against God, and God enters their story and he draws them to himself and he gives them the opportunity for a new way of life. And so I want you guys, before we get started, to talk with your life group, the people that you're with, and, and ask yourselves this question. Can you think of a story from the Bible where someone who was far from God was brought near to him and had a changed life? And then I want you to think, how about in real life? Do you know of somebody who has had a radical change in their life because of Jesus and has lived a completely different way because they have met Jesus? Talk about those two questions for a second and I'll see you back here in a minute. So hopefully you guys were able to think of a couple different examples in the Bible of people who maybe we would consider losers, people who were rebels, people who were far from God, who God brought back in into his presence and he used them for good things in his life. And maybe you even thought of some friends or maybe you thought about your own life. 
I don't really know, but I just know that our world, and I know that God's word is full of stories like that, of people who we would consider to be losers, of people we would think God could never use them. And he ends up picking them out and using them for his purposes. We see that he does that even in our own lives. I think about my own story, and yeah, maybe I never lived in pretty chaotic rebellion. I mean, I was eight years old when I put my trust in Jesus, so I wasn't out living a wild life before I trusted in Christ. But when I look at the things that I loved and how selfish and prideful I was when I came to know the Lord and how much I always wanted what Aaron wanted and not what was good for my family, not what was good for my sisters, I can see that since I've come to know the Lord, He has gradually changed my heart. And he's used a life that could have been bad. It could have led to destruction. Instead, he took my life and he showed grace and mercy on me. And he gave me the opportunity to have purpose and to walk with him and to see him use my life for his glory. And today we're going to be looking at the life of a woman named Rahab. And Rahab has a really interesting story and we find her story in Joshua chapter 2. So if you have your Bible or if you have your phone, whatever you're using, um, go ahead and flip to Joshua chapter 2 or go there on your phone and we're going to read parts of that together. I will just go ahead and warn you, it is kind of a long chapter, but we're going to read through it and then we are going to look at some observations from Rahab's story. So I'm going to grab my Bible, you grab yours, and we'll start reading Joshua 2. All right, got my Bible. Um, Joshua 2, we're going to start in verse 1. So really quick, what's going on right now is the people of God are about to enter the promised land. Joshua is their leader. Moses has recently died and Joshua is now leaving the charge. And so in order to go into the land God has provided for them, they have to go through Jericho. You've probably heard of Jericho, you know, the massive walls and a fortified city, really hard to get through. And so Joshua sends two spies into the city of Jericho. And that is where we meet Rahab. She is a resident of the city of Jericho. Look at verse 1 with me. So Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two men as spies from the Acacia Grove, saying, Go and scout out the land, especially Jericho. So they left, and they came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. So the first thing that we're going to see, the first observation we see from Rahab's story is that Rahab had a bad reputation. She was an outcast. She was a prostitute, and that is not a job that you wanted. Now, these women normally lived in the walls of the city. And this is generally, literally, like on the outside of the city as an outcast. Um, so she is on the, on the outside. And a lot of people, if they saw her in the streets, probably would have crossed to the other side of the street, would have considered her a loser. Well, let's keep reading a little bit. The king of Jericho was told, Look, some of the Israelite men have come here tonight to investigate the land. Then the king of Jericho sent word to Rahab and said, Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house, for they came to investigate the entire land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. So she said, Yes, the men did come to me, but I didn't know where they were from. And at nightfall, when the city gate was about to close, the men went out, and I don't know where they were going. Chase after them quickly, and you can catch up with them. So basically, she lies to the king. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them among the stalks of flax that she'd arranged on the roof. So what happens? Here we see a second observation. Rahab was afraid that she would lose her life, but she feared God and she didn't give in to the king. So the king comes and asks her question, but instead of fearing the king, she lies because she wants to protect these men. Why? Why does she want to protect these men? Well, if we keep reading in verse 8 and 9 and a little bit on, we'll see. It says this, Before the men fell asleep, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that the terror of you has fallen on us and everyone who lives in the land is panicking because of you. Why are the people panicking? Well, let's see. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you went, before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two Amorite kings you completely destroyed across the Jordan. When we heard this, we lost heart. And everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord, your God, is God in heaven above and on earth below. 
do you see this here? Rahab has heard stories about God, and she's like, in my mind, that God is more powerful than the king. So I'm going to put my trust in that God. So already, God is kind of stirring something up in Rahab's heart. She chooses the God of Israel over the king of her nation. This was pretty rare at that time, right? So let's keep, let's, let's keep reading. Um, we're going to see one more observation from Rahab's life. So we keep reading. And Rahab has a request for these men, starting in verse 12. She says, Now please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my father's family because I showed kindness to you. So give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father, mother, brothers, sisters, and all who belong to them and save us from death. Rahab realizes, like, if they don't seek God, they're going to die. They're going to die like all the other nations that the Israelites have come through because God is more powerful than all these kings. And God is bringing his people to a land. So she says, I want to be with y'all. I don't want to be left to the side. So the men answered her, we will give our lives for yours. If you don't report our mission, we will show kindness and faithfulness to you when the Lord gives us the land. So they say, yeah, Rahab, you can be part of our people if you keep your word to us. And so she promises, yes, she will take care of them. She won't tell the king that they've been there. She wants to be included with the people of God. And so what is the sign of this promise, this covenant, this oath that Rahab and these two spies have made? Well, it's a scarlet rope. She lets the men down a rope she, secretly, right? So nobody knows that they were there. She lets them down a rope so they can go back to their camp. And then the men tell her this in verse 18. They say, you keep this scarlet cord tied to the window, and that's going to be the sign that you, that you have kept your promise to us, and God is going to keep his promise to you. So she leaves that scarlet rope outside of her window as a sign that she trusts God. It says in verse 21, let it be as you say, she says to the men, and she sends them away. And after they'd gone, she tied the scarlet cord to her window. So the third observation I have from Rahab's story is this, that Rahab's scarlet rope in her window was proof of her trust in God. So this is symbolic, like I said, of her letting the spies live, but it also shows that she has now become an ally with Israel, right? Like allies in a war. She's saying, I'm on your side, you're on my side, but we're in this together. This was a huge step of trust. She's a foreigner. She's an outcast. She's, she's not anybody anyone would have chosen for this job of God bringing his people into their land. But this is the woman that God chose. So I want to ask you this question before we move into, a, before we go a little bit deeper. And the question is this, what stands out to you in Rahab's story? And how do you see God working in her life? talk about that for a couple minutes and we'll be back to dive deeper. Okay guys, hopefully you had some good discussion just diving a little bit deeper on your own into Rahab's story and seeing how God is using her life. Um, we don't know a lot about Rahab's life, but there are some lessons that we can learn from her. So I want to share three lessons that we can learn from Rahab's life and Rahab's story that we see here in the book of Joshua. The first lesson I think we can learn is that we have all been far from God. So we see here in Rahab's story that she is not really a part of God's people. She is outside of the nation of Israel, but God still chooses to bless her and later he welcomes her in to that group of people. Um, so we've also already talked about how Rahab was not really to be admired among her own people. She was probably poor. She was living on the wall of the city. We also see that she felt real fear about keeping her own life and her family's life. Um, and ultimately that the way that she had been living was evidence that she was far from God, that she was engaged in a job and in a profession that people who were following Jesus and seeking to keep his law would not have done. So we find her at this place where she's desperate. She wants to follow God. She wants a way out. She wants to become a part of God's people. But at one point, she was far from God. And this is kind of reflected in each of our stories. Even if you grew up in church, even if you 
have Christian parents, that does not mean that you were born a Christian. It doesn't mean that I was born a Christian. Every one of us, at some point in our life, when we, when we are born into this world, we are born with sin. We are born like little rebellious babies. <laughs> Just, it's in our nature to want to rebel against God. And so each one of us at a certain point in our life has been far from God. That is why we all need the good news of the gospel. And so I know we've been in Joshua chapter two, but I want you guys to turn to Ephesians chapter two with me. And I wanna share with you Ephesians 2 verses 12 through 14. So verse 12 says this, at that time, so before you met Christ, that's what we're talking about, at that time, you were without Christ. You were excluded from the citizenship of Israel and foreigners to the covenants to the covenants of promise, without hope and without God in the world. Now this is written to the church in Ephesus, but it could have been written to Rahab, right? It could also be written to each one of us. So verse 13 says this, But now in Christ Jesus, you who are far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility. So Jesus, because of his death, he takes those who were far off, who were not part of God's family, and he invites them to become part of his family. And that brings us to our second point. And the second point is this, that we can know God if we put our trust in Jesus Christ. So the first lesson that we learn is we've all been far from God, but the good news we find in lesson number two is that we can know God if we put our trust in Jesus Christ. We see this trust, this hope that Rahab had is symbolized in the red cord that she hangs outside of her window. That red cord symbolizes a lot of things, but it symbolizes to her that this God is going to keep his promises to her. It symbolizes to her that she's not putting her trust in the king of Jericho to keep her safe. Instead, she believes the words of God, and she trusts that he is going to keep her family safe. And because of that, she's going to give her life to him and put her life in his hands. So Rahab was desperate. Death and life really lay before her in that moment. And I think sometimes in our life, we don't see our decision to follow Jesus or to put our trust in God as a life and death decision. I mean, most of us in sixth and seventh and eighth grade aren't grappling with life and death decisions, right? We're, we're wrestling with what should I eat for lunch today? Like pizza rolls or just a handful of goldfish, which hopefully you're eating more than that. But these are the decisions that we're thinking about. Or maybe, you know, we're thinking, what classes am I going to take next year? What, what position do I want to go out for on the softball team this year? These don't seem like life and death decisions, but the Bible tells us that putting our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ is a decision that results in either life or death. Um, and it's, it is one that, that we each have to make because we were all born far from God. And so Ephesians 2, once again, gives us a little bit of insight into this. So if you look at verses 4 and 5 in Ephesians 2, it says this, But God, who is rich in mercy because of the, his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in trespasses. You were saved by grace. So it's God who can take us from death to life. And when we realize that our decision of following Jesus is a death or life decision, we realize like, oh, this is, this is big. You know, I, I need to either put my trust in Christ or I need to face the facts that, that you know, I, I'm taking my life into my own hands and I'm not trusting my life into to the God of the universe. Um, but we see in Rahab's life that she recognized that decision and she put her trust in the God who, who could part the seas and who could destroy kingdoms. And she said, this God, he has all the power, so I'm going to put my trust in him. So my question for you before we move on to our last point is this. Have you put your trust in Jesus Christ? What does that mean? Talk about that with your life group. What does it mean to put your trust in Jesus? And what, what do you think it means to know God. Do you know God? Talk about that for a couple minutes and then come back for our last point. Okay guys, hopefully you got a chance to share your story a little bit and get a little honest with your life group just about whether or not you have put your faith 
in Jesus Christ. I hope that if you have, that you see fruit in your life, but maybe if you haven't put your trust in Jesus Christ yet, hopefully this story about Rahab is making you think a little bit about what it means to put your trust in Jesus. In a sense, I like to keep in my mind that picture of Rahab putting out her red cord out of her window as a, as a statement to all the people around her, I'm putting my trust in Jesus. I mean, this was an impossible situation. She knew that Israel was gonna come and destroy her city, but instead she put her faith in God. She hung a rope outside of her window, which when has that ever saved anyone before? <laughs> Never, except for this one instance, right? But it was, it was in trusting that God was gonna keep his promises to her and it was in just, just hanging that cord outside of her window, almost doing almost nothing um, that God saved her. And that's the same in, in our lives, in our walk with Jesus. We do nothing, right? We, in a sense, just hang the cord out of our window. We say, yes, I'm putting my faith in Jesus because of all the things that he has done for me. I believe in the things that he's done for me, and I trust that God is going to keep his promises to me. And so I'm hanging that red cord outside of the window. So that leads me to our third and final point, which is this. God is trustworthy and he keeps his promises to us. So ultimately, Rahab's story, the story about this woman who we might say is part of the Losers Club, is really a story about God. It's really a story about God. It's about his faithfulness and his willingness to bring people who are far from him into his people, into a relationship with him. And so your story is not about you either. Rahab's story was not about her. It was about God. Your story is not about you. Your story is about bringing God glory. So how do we see this in Rahab's life? Well, um, in, in Joshua chapter 2, like I said, which is where we've been, in verse 14, I'm going to get there. Um, she's... The, the men tell her as they're leaving the city, they say, we will give our lives for yours. If you, if you don't report our mission, we will show kindness and faithfulness to you when the Lord gives us the land. This is the promise that they give to her. And we flip a couple pages over to Joshua 6.25, and we see this. Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute, her father's family, and all who belonged to her because she hid the messengers Joshua had sent to spy on Jericho, and she lives in Israel to this day. So basically, what this verse is saying, God kept his promise to Rahab and to her family, and he took them to be part of his family. She lived among the people of Israel because she put her faith and her trust in God. He kept his promises to her. And this promise not just extended through Rahab's life, but beyond. God like multiplied her faithfulness and, and multiplied his own faithfulness in Rahab's life. Because if we go to the first book of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, um, when we look in verse 5, we see in the line of Jesus the name of a woman who we might consider a loser. It says this in Matthew 1, 5, Salmon fathered Boaz by Rahab. Boaz fathered Obed by Ruth. Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered King David. That's pretty amazing. Rahab was one of the grandmothers down the line of King David. And you know who came, came from King David? Jesus. So Rahab not only just puts her trust in God, but she becomes part of God's family directly through in the line of Jesus. And so... What, is, what about us? Like, yes, we've said Rahab's story was really about bringing God glory, and our story is really about bringing God glory. Well, back in Ephesians 2, um, we see that this whole gift of salvation that we've been given through Jesus Christ in Ephesians 2, in verse 10, it tells us why. Verse 10 says this, We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Ultimately, God created us for a purpose, and that was to do good works that would glorify him, to become people who love God, who love the things of God, and want to live lives for his glory. So ultimately, our lives are not about us. Rahab's life was not about her. But sometimes God chooses the people who the world may consider losers, the world may consider the last to be chosen, and God chooses them and uses them 
for his glory. And he uses them in his story. And that is pretty amazing. So I want you guys to reflect on that as we close today and talk about that with your life groups. Go back to Ephesians 2.10, read that again, maybe spend some time in Ephesians 2. But here are some closing questions for you. Do you sometimes get stuck in believing that your life is about you? How can you remind yourself that your story can be used for God's glory? And going specifically back to Ephesians 2.10 that tells us that God's people are his, are his workmanship created for good works, how do you see that in Rahab's story? And then, how do you see God doing that in your life? It's been such a joy to be with you guys this morning. I hope you can talk about those questions. And, and, and I pray that you have a great week and that you walk with the Lord, you walk more closely with Him, that you love Jesus more, and you do the good works that God's prepared beforehand for you to do.